So thank you all. It is such a pleasure to be here. Can you all hear me? I have a very big voice, so I'm not going to work with a mic if I can avoid it. This is my favorite chapter, my favorite association. And I have to confess, it is the only time I've presented here formally. So a uh, real, real pleasure to be with you. Tonight, as Joe mentioned, Anne and I want to really look at what the nitty gritties are in terms of making us better professionals. So how many of you are organizational effectiveness consultants or coaches? Anyone? O OD background? Okay, we've got some of those. And how many are you of you are coming from a background of career development? Good, good, excellent. And then the rest of you, I assume, are uh, training and development? Okay, great. How many of you have experienced being downsized or right-sized or reorged or <laughs> outsourced wrong, wrong, sized. <laughs> wrong sized yeah okay um, what what uh, I'm wondering is how many of you would like at this point to have a more impactful role in your function whatever that is whether you're internal or external how many of you would really like, see, I think that's why you're here. Yeah, makes, may, makes sense. Um, and to maybe make a difference that's measurable to the bottom line of your business. Anybody interested in that? Okay, good. So among other things, I'm going to talk tonight about a couple of cases. I um, led a program for the U.S. Department of Labor a number of years ago where we actually doubled productivity in targeted leaders' offices. Would that be a good headline for you? Would that be a, a, a good, yeah. Doubling productivity is good. And what about making the front page of the Wall Street Journal? Anybody want to have your program on the front page of the Wall Street Journal? We did that with, and I've forgotten the individual who was in contracting and working with um, uh, construction people. Well, Raj, I think it was you now. So the Kitchell Corporation is a, a former client where we did a whole lot of work on leadership development with this program, and we worked with um, succession planning particularly. and. I'm going to be talking briefly about some of that. So what I, I hope to do is to review the system that we have found very, very successful over all of these years in a number of different organizations and uh, give you a sense, this is my idea of a system, <laughs> one representation. The heart of this system and this particular approach is competency development, leadership competency development. So we're going to go over that and then we want to do some exploration of several of these cases to make you hopefully gold star, gold medal winners back in your organization with them. That's the whole idea. And at the end, we hope to have enough time for a and a And in fact, I'm, I'm counting on it because I'm sure that there's going to be a lot that I forget to, to mention tonight. So uh, many of you may know the work of the um, uh, Corporate Productivity Institute. Anyone familiar with, with that? I reference them every year to take a good look at where, where their statistics show the influence for our profession is going to be and where the need is, where the greatest need is. In 2010 and 2011, 
it was leadership development. Last year it was leadership development with an edge to dealing with change. This year's stats and this year's material is not out yet, but I happen to um, sneak in to get some data from them. And what they say was very interesting to me given particularly tonight's presentation. They're talking about the fact that we're no longer going to be able to be just better business partners. We need to be performance advisors. And we need to be able to move people in our organizations through work on leadership, through work on managing talent, not, not talent management anymore. It's managing talent that get the difference. Through expanding the culture that will be uh, an enabler of success. Some of this is not such old news. And through actual performance that will increase market share. Now all of this means alignment with the strategy of the organization in ever better ways. Do you agree? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So here's my model for working on that. It's the heart of it is this shared clarity on core competencies. The real sense of moving that then that shared clarity on the core competencies of your organization to recruiting and hiring, to implementing a coaching culture, to every facet of performance management, leadership development, <coughs> succession planning, and certainly career development. Okay? That's how my system works. That's how it looks. Now, as I've mentioned several times, it begins with core competencies. And many, many organizations are not able to really work with these because they've never been properly defined. So we've got to start there. Really critical. And there's a bit of a problem with <laughs> getting that defined because, of course, we are talking and we're speaking about the individual's capacity and their competencies in leadership. But we're also speaking about those critical success factors that are going to make a difference in terms of the market. Now, I know some of you, several of you are from academia, some of you are from nonprofits. We've worked with all of you in a number of, of different ways, but but well, I'm going to use the word market share, and I think you'll get that that really refers to goal. Angie? Is it okay if we ask questions, or do you want to wait? Well, thank you. Yes, it's, if, if it's critical, yes, uh, let's, let's do it. Uh, I prefer, if you can hold it, that, that we do it at the end, just because of the time thing. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if it's critical. My question was just going to be, and you can wait till the end if you want. Uh, if you said that companies aren't using or not, they're not getting the idea of core competency, and I was just wondering, in your experience, what's getting in the way of that? What, what are they not getting? Where is the gap? And you might be I'm going to leave some of that to Anne, okay. but I, I will speak to it indirectly through this, too. Thank you. Uh, great question. Super question. So I want to go back to the case study business because I think this makes it hopefully real. So I'm sitting in my office one bright sunny afternoon and the phone rings and it's a young man from the Department of uh, Labor who's in human resources there and he's been chartered with doing a huge change management effort to make the Department of Labor imagine, I mean, it was really, to make the Department of Labor successful in turning their leadership 
competencies into much more team-based, much more emotional intelligence, a whole lot of work on um, sense of performance in the organization, moving away from that culture of entitlement. That's the job. And he decided that he was going to use, and this was his, um, his sense of it, he wanted to use a program that was going to be connected with the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Now, I have nothing against Who Moved My Cheese. I, I think it's great, it was good. You know, but it is not enough for the scope of the challenge that he was given or taxed with, in my opinion. So I worked with him for, oh, probably an hour on the phone to get better clarity, of course, on what his real issues were. And it became crystal clear that if they could and this, of course, was my point of view, raise the level of competency and general understanding of leadership competencies through a coaching program, particularly a coaching program, which is where I was coming from, that they could meet with some success. Well, much to my surprise, they bought into it. And I became the mentor coach for this internal team chartered with this. This was the model for leadership competency development that I had developed. Now, it didn't look like this at this time, but it had all of the 42 leadership competencies based on the Harvard leadership studies, which I had started writing years ago when um, Space Systems Laurel purchased Ford Aerospace and I got taxed with, um, with my business partner coaching those top 65 leaders of that organization. There's a need when people, particularly we were doing paper and pencil 360s at that time, but there's a need for anybody who's in the middle of that change, and I was speaking with Raj about it earlier, uh, to really have something tactile, something s that they can hold on to, to understand some of those competencies. And that's when I started writing my, my skill kit units and putting those together. So we have leadership competency resource units behind all of these 42 skills. And my model is that, of course, I see three arenas of leadership. And behind each one of those arenas, there's task, people, and self. There are certain roles that I work with my clients about picking up their role as a strategist. Those are competency units. But if you break that down, if they're going to be strategic, they have to know systems thinking, they have to be able to scan the environment, they have to align vision, mission, and goals, and do contingency planning. So each of the leadership role units, which are robust, has sub-competencies in it that are also resourced. Well, back to my story. Where I've met success in working with this, it's been in making sure that the leaders that we're working with got a coach approach. And who better to train them than the individuals in training to up your competencies in coaching so that you can support what's happening in the culture. Remember that the five domains, the culture and performance there. So that's particularly critical. Here, what I've given you, and I'm going to try to move quickly um, because we've got um, Anne coming, who's got the in the trenches currently experience to, to discuss with some of this. But here's our definition from our competency unit on coaching. All of our uh, definitions are behavioral. Every unit's got behavioral definitions. But you'll just see everything that's in red 
I see as directly connected to modeling leadership development. That alone supports the development of leadership competency. In other words, if you get how to work with a coach approach, it translates down through the organization. It cascades down through the organization. So what happened at the DOL? What were the pieces there? I, as I mentioned, became mentor coach to an internal team. They went off and got certified as coaches through uh, the corporate coaching clinic. We use the corporate coaching clinic as an engine because so many of these leaders in the DOL had no concept of leadership or leadership competency. And uh, so we needed a kind of an upfront training vehicle to actually give them some of those concepts. And then the coaches, the internal coaches and some from the actual organization who got certified or worked on their coaching, they uh, coached for six months, several coaching sessions each month with a handful of clients from, that were in our pilot group. Um, I don't think I need to tell many of you that there needs to be a conviction that this is going to be a program that in fact gives feedback to uh, the rest of the bigger organization. It has to be a development intervention. And to do that, selection of the right pilot group is particularly important. You don't just go in and choose any group. Particularly important is whether that group has the not too many problems and issues and business concerns or too little to show up. And we also were very selective about who we were picking relative to which leader of which potential pilot group could be the best champion of it. So we did that uh, analysis of success factors for the program with the cross-organizational diagonal slice team down through the organization, including the, um, one of the labor heads for the Department of Labor set on that. So here's uh, the model for the corporate coaching clinic skills, and you'll notice that the coaching skills um, listed at the bottom that I've highlighted again in red are, again, very, very consistent with just basic good leadership competencies. So we start with that. However, here's my model again. Every single item on this in red is connected with a skill unit that different leaders needed developing on and were given support with the competency development unit. So about halfway through this program, I got real clear that, of course, this would be a bigger success, have more impact, if we could spread it to the leaders so that they could use this in recruiting and hiring. Well, how are they going to do that? They're going to do that through the competency definitions. Because those competency definitions are going to support them in how they write the job posting, how they do their interviewing, do behavioral interviews, and really look for those competencies, and basically training them on handling the whole uh, leadership element of recruiting and hiring. We also got clear that if these leaders could use these skills in improving their performance management process, that they would get better results from their direct reports, right? So that increases performance. Um, since that time, the National Public Radio has used my, uh, my skill kit, and they mandated that every one of their offices across the United States 
all the leaders in those offices had to use, uh, they probably hate me, <laughs> but they had to use the competency definitions for languaging their performance reviews and for writing performance appraisals with those competencies invest, embedded in it. They uh, not only saw much better morale around the performance management process, but guess what? Their performance in those offices increased as well. So um, testimony again to that. Now marrying the skills support to your leadership development program is probably a, a no-brainer in that you're, there's a, a multiple number of ways that you can do that. But what we've done frequently is use them as resources behind a 360 or, as I said, the performance review process. Support for development plans working uh, to, to just get the units out in the system through the web. It's a web-based program. Um, handing it off as self-study units in a, a small group. There are a lot of ways of using it to enhance leadership development. And the use of these competencies will accelerate your succession planning. Uh, because if you know uh, where you're weak in your organization, then you can attack that with this, this competency plan, right? If somebody needs further training to move that individual to get that training in maybe experience in another uh, part of the organization, no matter how you're going to uh, pull on that. But it, it again goes back to those um, critical competencies and what they know and really understand about that particular competency. So uh, succession planning, by the way, always starts with a good connection to the business plan of whatever business unit you're in. And so uh, that takes us right back again to the five domains. And I think finally, the uh, last but not least piece is when we are doing career development in organizations, we're frequently, at least that's what I get called in for, assessing the individuals for how they can better maximize their strengths and perhaps change to a role where they don't have to work with their weaknesses. And how to do that, again, is very much influenced by those competency development units. So that's my pipeline for moving toward what we want to be is impactful performance ad advisors. And uh, your organization being an employer of choice. I'm going to um, turn this over to Anne now. Uh, I think that uh, is, uh, I think we better just go with it, Anne. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Diane. Sure. Thank you. What a, what a joy. Um, I, I am delighted to be here, and I am here, and as somebody asked in the lunch line, I believe, you know, oh, so what brings you here? I'm like, Diane. <laughs> she asked me to come. Um, I have been working with Diane on and off over, I believe, about eight years. And one of the things that I find most compelling is exactly what she has at the heart of her model, and that is competencies. In our work, we are talking about humans at work, we're talking about people, we're talking about behavior. And in my journey in working with people in organizations over a number of years, we, we can't go forward unless we have a lighthouse, unless we have a place to grasp that's meaningful and useful for working with our talent, for working with the people that need to move the organization forward. 
Now what's interesting is over the 20 years that I've been in the industry, we actually haven't come so far, if you think about it. Any other experiences along this line? You know, that we've made incremental changes in terms of doing better leadership development. We've done a lot of good work. It has not stuck systemically. And part of what I love about what Diane has put together and in working with her in the evolution of her product is that it starts at the heart of the matter. And I started working with Diane and implemented her work at Roche Molecular Diagnostics um, eight years ago or more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, and I did it because it was clear, it was concrete, it was competency based. At the time it was a, a CD mm. of the competencies and it was not thought of as systemic, but Diane and I both entered through the leadership development area and we said, you know what, my people need to know this. It's quick, it's compact, it's comprehensive in terms of the research Diane's done to say what are the development competencies needed. So to the question uh, in the back about competencies and do companies have them or not have them or in what shape are they in, it's been my experience that that's all over the map, that there are many companies that don't have them. They assess a situation, people are having a problem, they want to increase the careers or give people something to look forward to. They throw a bunch of training programs at them and people are getting developed, which is nice. It's a nice to have. We don't want to take that away. But it's not necessarily aligned with the business. There are some, some companies that actually have competencies that are identified based on values in the business. And so they're sort of more esoteric and hard to measure. And what they've done is say, this is an important value for the business and we want to see evidence of good ethical behavior or integrity or good teamwork. And we evaluate people against that, but we don't give them the language. We presume that people understand behavioral language. And I, I don't know how many people have worked with people that have, um, oh, you're not a good team player as one of the lines on the performance development. And when asked, how do I become a good team player? What does that mean? People can't reply. And so this grounded and gave definition and framework and language to an area of the business that didn't have it. And then there are businesses that do have really good competencies model. I had the opportunity to work under the J&J &J umbrella with LifeScan Corporation and they had good competency model baseline. And there's lots more work to, to do in that area. So when I thought back on how I've worked with Diane and using the tool, I thought, I, I gotta be an advocate for this. <laughs> because it, it lands in several areas that I think are critical. So it lands in the area of clarity around what is our focus as human resource professionals. If we're here and committed to developing people at work, how are we measuring the success of that? And the better the language, the more clarity we have, the more clarity we can give to the business, the more education and knowledge can be transferred. We sharpen the saw all across the business. Everyone can be more impactful, you can be more efficient, you can be more effective. And, and this is what our business wants from us as leaders in this industry. So I moved it then to LifeScan. So it was very basic, in, and, and Diane's model is chunked. So I can just use a piece of it. I used it for leadership development at Roche. At LifeScan, we took it a little bit further. I bought the package, we implemented it, we had it up uh, as a soft um, on the web for e-learning and self-training for people. We marketed it and branded it internally through the internet. We marketed it through a blended learning solution and ran some programs against some of the key topic areas. And then we did something which was a little more compelling. We trained up all of our HR business partners in the tool. And we let them start adding it into the business and moving it forward. So it's not just me as a learning professional passing and waving the banner and passing it forward. 
it was a whole community of people who when someone said, gee, I, I got this manager who's not doing very well, he's terrible at conflict, he keeps yelling and screaming at everybody, but he's really great technically and we want to keep him, how do we help develop him in some way? And the HR business partner was then in a, in a capacity, in a role, and had the tools at their fingertips to respond. Um, so that was another piece of the pipeline. Uh, as I moved forward to Altera, we're, we're still working on the Altera. So um, the application is we have bought the CD. We have several put it years on, ago. Yeah. yeah several years ago, right when I started. I yeah, think it's almost yeah, over yeah. four years ago, right when I started. I was like, come on, Diane, we got some more work to do. Um, <clears throat> and we, we brought it in. We added it to our internet quickly. We trained up our HR partners quickly. We started looking more broadly at how we can add it. And about the same time as when I learned that you had actually gone broad and systemic, um, and we are now looking at how do we train up both our HR business partners and add the e-learning suite um, into the business in some way. It's still a work in progress. And some of the things I wanted to share about that journey have to do with the lessons. Um, the thing that I think is most entertaining about this industry is that the <laughs> Einstein quote is very apropos. Insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, is a lot of what HR and learning professionals have done by default. The systems have not supported them to be strategic. We've often had to go in and firefight. We have to do performance development. We have to do succession planning. We have to think about a leadership program. And rarely are they aligned. We're doing a lot of activities in a lot of pockets, but there's not alignment. My goal now and what I'm trying to achieve in the work that I do is systemic. The lessons, however, are that there are politics, there's structures, there's money, there are all of these obstacles for us to be effective and productive in our work. And so what I've learned, and these are the real lessons, is apply the work wherever you can. Start something, start somewhere. If your company's waving the banner and has a problem with succession planning, start there. What's our baseline for success planning? How are we going to measure and promote people from individual contributor manager, from manager to director, from director, let's use competencies. Enter with competencies and then add it to performance, then add it to leadership development. You can enter where you are, go where the energy is, work with the system to start momentum because at the heart of the matter, we have got to be able to speak a language of behaviors with people. That, that's the development edge. We have to be in that conversation, not in the back end with a magic wand because we understand behaviors and nobody else does. That knowledge has to be transferred. We can't transfer it without a common language. Expand the work once you have recognized the baseline. So what we were able to do at Roche is put it in and we marketed it to the organization and then we marketed it and started selling it more broadly um, and added it to the performance management. Got them talking about the competencies in relation to performance management. That's as far as I got with that one before I left. So I don't know <laughs> what the state of it is. I didn't follow up. Um, persevere and persevere some more. Our work is about one step forward and sometimes two or three steps back. Um, I was teasing this year after doing a lot of work of trying to build leadership capability that I should have worn the Halloween costume of Sisyphus. Uh, that I really feel often like I'm pushing this ball uphill and I get to the top and it's like, yes, I saw the light go on. People are aware and awake and they did something differently. And then the next morning I come in and there's another roadblock <laughs> or another <laughs> ball to push uphill. Um, we do this because we love it, because we believe in people. We do this because we can see that it is use, useful and I would dare say necessary for businesses to be successful. And business and the mindset of business does not understand fully <laughs> the importance or the value of this. Now, what's interesting is we're in a time where they're understanding it more. 
Uh, more and more we're talking about the, the survey that Diane talked about, the talent m uh, management. Um, and it's critical to be able to manage talent. <coughs> and you need systems, processes, and tools to do that. Um, finally, make this personal. Uh, make this a personal commitment. You are the driver. One of the under, other fundamental pieces of the work as I see it, as I've had the experience over my lovely journey of 25 plus years, <laughs> um, it's about leaders. Leaders in our businesses, in our organizations, nonprofit or otherwise, are the leverage point. They are the people who are going to help make or break the business ultimately. So I really feel like our work is the most important work in the industry. Building the capability of people, giving them the right tools at the right time so that they can do the right thing is critical. And we are not just that backroom person that might get acknowledged someday. We, we actually are the catalysts of the change in industry and the way we can grow. And partners like Diane, the tools that Diane has developed are really the reason that I'm here tonight because I feel like I have to walk the talk and be a champion for this kind of work. We need to have systems. We need to have places to work with those systems. We need to enter where we are. And, and we need to have these partners to make it happen because none of us are doing it alone. So time for Q&A, I yeah, believe. Yeah, yeah. So, Do you well, it? Oh, yeah. yeah, this is the final piece. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Sam. Uh, of course, you don't get why I love having clients like Anne. <laughs> I mean, I've been very, very blessed. And I've been, I, I failed to mention that it's been a real, real pleasure beginning to think about doing this presentation with, with her. And I'm incredibly grateful, obviously. I hope that's obvious. So, um, questions, yes. Uh, <coughs> one of the things that I see here in uh, all the years that I've been so, training, yeah, stand up. running companies, I don't see here as a lesson learned uh, a very, very important component. <coughs> The component I'm talking about that I see missing, uh, and I haven't heard it yet, is the very important issue of gaining commitment from senior management, from the CEO on right, down. Right, right. If you do not have that commitment mm -hmm. to have the development of their people, to educate their people, to buy into this, you have to sell it, not market it, sell it to the CEO and senior management gain their commitment so that you can do these things. That's right. If you don't have this, mm -hmm. you can't do anything. That's been my experience. So, um, are you getting a commitment? That's what I would like to So you are absolutely right and could not uh, agree more. And as I said, uh, truly, I know I've been very, very fortunate to have some outstanding clients. The CEO of the Kitchell Corporation, that construction company, a $6 billion uh, consulting engineering contracting development organization, needed to work on succession planning. And he connected with me about doing that. And um, we, we did it. But of course, I had his backing, and that's why we made the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and I know that's true. So thank you for pointing that out. I think that you're seeing more. What I'm seeing is more leadership awareness at the very top of the organization. But what I think we need to do, and from what Anne's already said, essentially, is show them how we connect to performance and to market, right? Show them how we make a difference to the bottom line and to actual results. Now, doubling productivity, I mean, yes, we did 360s at the DOL. And yes, we did um, <laughs> a whole lot of other assessments. And I didn't even know that they did these productivity studies 
you know, from the year before and then compared results. But our program, the pilot ran during 9-11. The DOL in Washington, D.C. was where we were primarily running it from, okay. And these people were incredibly stressed. The work saw them through that whole period and in the targeted leaders offices, they doubled productivity and morale increased and they saw huge increases. We did the ECI, the Emotional Competence Inventory. We got huge results on that. We got huge results on our 360 retake and on the uh, final interviews that I did. Fabulous. And remember I said I selected with the help of the internals that champion for yeah. the pilot and that it spread from there. I, w I would add years. and I, wa I really want to honor and acknowledge that I, I agree 130 percent that when you get commitment from the top it works best. My experience is that that's about one percent of the time and the <laughs> reason that I put my first lesson up is start where there's energy because that's where we can start. And we don't have to wait for full commitment to start to create momentum to get the commitment and show the result. So I, I agree. My fantasy, I had, a, I had somebody ask me recently, you've done a lot of really cool work and had some great impact and you know, what would be the one thing that would be really, really cool to do next? And that is to be an equal partner to the CEO in running the business. <laughs> I'm, I'm holding, I'm, you know, I'm holding out. I, feel, I figure I have a few more years. I'm going to hold out and see if I can make it. If happen. anybody can do it, she can. Yeah. <laughs> um, one in the back. Angie. Mm. One of the things that I really like about a competency model is it gives an organization, here's in particular, Diane, it gives an organization a common language and a common behavior that somebody can work toward in their leadership development, success, mm -hmm. planning, you know, whatever, whatever the goal is. One of the things that I'm struggling in my program right now is, yes, the competencies are good, they're behavioral, they're behaviorally anchored, um, but it's the accountability piece. How do I hold the individuals who are in the program accountable for their own development? This has not been a development culture, it's been more of a performance improvement culture, so it's, I get the shift in thinking, but I, I'm struggling with holding them accountable. How do you do that? What is your, your Suggestion. Well, uh, in coaching, um, in running a formal coaching program, at the end of each coaching session, we, we have an agenda. First of all, I always say 90% of the success is in the contracting with the individual. And to do that means sometimes spending a bit of time with that individual to find out where their real resistance is. Okay. So you're going to work with the the deeper level if you can, if you can set up your coaching or your performance development sessions, use coaching as a model for that, whatever, that uh, are going to um, give that individual a sense that if they do some of this and work with it, that it's going to mean a difference to them as a leader a real difference and of course doing that with 360s doing that with their performance review sometimes it's the stick instead of the carrot right but but to really get a sense of where their barriers are and so we work on those in those coaching sessions and at the end of the coaching session what is it that they're going to try out that's new and different that should give them some results between that session and the next coaching session. Are they realistic in the time that they can spend on that? And I always check that out. What is the amount of time that you really have for uh, pulling your team together and trying out some of these new behaviors? Do you want to rely on that person's manager to give them that, that kind of time? Or when, I, when I do a program, I always, I get with the client first, the person that uh, I've been told I need to improve <laughs> uh, or support, and then I try to do a three-way with that individual's 
um, manager and I get a sense of the way that they're working together and that's been phen phenomenally successful because that gives me a sense of the nature of that relationship that gives me a sense of how they communicate and that gives me a sense of whether uh, that individual can be supportive of this individual's development. I have my client explain what he or she wants to do with these coaching sessions and what their development plan goals are in that initial session. That, that uh, was indirect. where I was going to go. So what, what your no. question brought up to, brought to <coughs> mind for me, which I think is very apropos, and Diane just described it in part, is if the issue is accountability with individuals, look at the system. Where in the system is there a place where you can create some energy and partnership to get that greater accountability? And in this case, this example is the, either the managers or the HR business partners. So creating a, a system that's more broad um, could also be a part of the solution. And you touched on it. Mm. Intuitively, I think uh, business ethics is of rising importance. So how do you infuse or diffuse something like that? Say more, Raj, about what you mean by that. Um, you know, it's shifting from the profit focus to it's the right thing to do. That's a soft skill. Um, you always know when you're operating under leaders that are, you know, behaving in an ethically correct way. Yeah. How do you grow that kind of thing? That's a great question. Yes. I, so think, I think what I'd like to um, share is that part of where, what I bring to the business is a strategic approach. And I have many methodologies and models that I use to frame the conversation about how do we shift people's thinking so that they are more mindful, aware, and value some of the things that have not historically been valued in business. I'm not sure, um, this is probably a whole separate learning conversation and or event. Mm -hmm. How many people here are familiar with the methodology of Herman Brain Dominance? instrument a couple yeah. of you yeah so I use that as a basic framework and um, to, to answer your question it's a holistic perspective it's a model which can be spoken to in terms of concrete business language mm -hmm. and when I use it with leaders who are primarily results and ROI focused I help them to see more broadly how limited it is because when you look at the model it has four basic quadrants and I won't go into great detail but the keys are results which is many of our business leaders process which is another large portion of our leaders and the way they structure business and then you have development people communication stuff and you have big picture and strategy and so one of the ways that I try to help people is to give them a different perspective. And I get them accountable to, if you're just doing results, you're missing all of this in the business. Mm -hmm. And once they see that, there's a shift, and I can now talk about the behaviors in each of these other areas, like strategy, communication, conflict management, process, execution, all the things that they may not do. So it's a, it's a, a framework for guiding a conversation of you being more productive or effective. I, I would just uh, second that and, and say, um, usually if someone is coming from a hierarchical authoritarian uh, total results approach and uh, soft skills is not their, their language, I work as hard as I can to make the soft skills congruent with their language, with their approach, to give them a sense of, um, you know, that is bottom line in some fashion. Is that, that's pretty much what, what I think Ann was, was talking about too, yeah. So I saw another hand here, oh, okay, hi. 
and ask with the advent of the, the growth of the competency models online. There's just different vendors and it seems like it's hard to even keep up with what are the different offerings today. And obviously you put together a wonderful model using research from Harvard and Thank you. Thank you. So keeping that in mind, I'm just kind of curious, looking at your pipeline and looking at what the growth is, it's like any software tool, you can you can buy it, but many people use five or 10% of the capability of what mm -hmm. a database tool or a software tool is. I'm curious what you think is, yourself and Anne, um, Anne here think, is an area on your pipeline that is being greatly neglected with the advent of the competency models that are being that are being supported by online tools. Where do you think the greatest trend is for growth <laughs> with these tools that are utilizing competency models? Well, I'm I'm very biased on this one, and I I'm going to go have Anne answer first, and I'll chip in. Okay. Thank you, that's a great question. Yeah, I, the thing that came popped to mind as you asked the question was succession planning. Um, and uh, although when I look at the model, it's, you can go a lot of places. Uh, my experience, especially with the talent focus, you know, so every business, you know, what keeps you up at night as a CEO is my talent, you know, the talent pool, the future talent, how do I train them fast enough for the future competencies they're going to need. And I think the succession planning processes are totally detached from the people and from what's real. Mm -hmm. uh, that what happens is I really like Joe, so he's on my succession map. And it has very little to do with his competency or future interest. Mm -hmm. So my first gut response without much thought <laughs> was succession planning. But again, I would argue that if the whole organization has really agreed, truly bought into the core competency approach, that that should not be a factor. In other words, those leaders could be brought back to, okay, but hey, no, because this individual is not performing in this particular area, or this individual needs more experience over here. And we have to, to do something about that. We have to move that around or work with that, okay? The other thing that I, well, I was going to say, I think the part that gets short shrift would be the turning the, uh, doing a coach approach in a way that makes sense across the greater organization. Because I frankly have never turned uh, a group a huge number like we did at the DOL or uh, I, I can name a numerous in, I use this at AT&T Capital I worked with a number of, of organizations I've never done it without there being some of the engine that I mentioned of teaching somehow and we're talking about getting them to really grok what it means to be a coach so you can start with internals like yourselves or those working in this field. That's fabulous. And you get them going to work in the organization. Um, I've worked with internals at Mayo and they're really working this model well with, with the doctors at, at Mayo. Um, yeah, and they do training with it, but you can't just do the self-study resource units and expect it to stick without some of the rest of the model, right? I mean, that's my, my whole belief. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Yeah. I'm out of the tunnel here. <laughs> so, as I was looking at your pipeline for success, a lot of us could relate to the pipeline. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, we had some comments about leaders that are beyond the bottom line numbers and the metrics and that they focus on the people and understand the value of their human resources and growing those people. And then you have the really, really exceptional leaders, I like to call them hero leaders. Mm -hmm. um, in all of the various roles in an organization, you talk about core competency, 
we list them, we recruit for them. Do you know of any organization that recruits for hero leaders? Well, I think those hero qualities are identifiable and can be connected to certain core competencies. Particularly strong would be down there in my model with the self and looking at self-awareness, looking at emotional intelligence, looking at, uh, to a certain extent, a hero leader has got to have a uh, competency of, of being strategic. Uh, I would argue. And there are companies that look for those core competencies. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I see yeah. a lot of companies doing that, and certainly we're doing that. Our leaders are, are being much more mindful of what are the capabilities and skills broadly. And the, the conversation at the E staff is very much about our leaders cannot just be technical experts. Our, our leaders need to know how to lead the business broadly, how to develop people, how to have interpersonal skills, how to be savvy in front of the market, uh, in front of stakeholders. Uh, they're looking. Um, we have are hiring, in particular, in the past 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, it's like they've rewritten the interviewing process to include those types of things, which is really very compelling and interesting. Um, it's wreaking havoc with the leaders that are already in play. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as you can imagine, what ha then happens systemically is there's a new bar and a new measure. And so there's, there's a lot of energy around evaluating mm -hmm. leaders. Uh, as a result of now having brought in a number of people who have different capabilities, hero leaders, or people who have broader and deeper competence than our traditional up through the ranks kind of leadership. Okay, another question here. Good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so your, your system is for an entire organization. Uh, large companies, medium-sized companies, and so well, on. Uh, Mark, it, it is also usable with just individuals, but it's no longer sold on an individual basis. Right. Okay. It um, was at one point. That's what I, just to get a, a framework. What happens in, in an organization that has union employees? How do you apply this? A so. Lot of so um, I mentioned that design team that, well, uh, we put together at the U.S. Department of Labor, and I mentioned that we had labor involved. And that's where I suggest you start. You work with labor, and I've used this with labor members in organizations members of labor organizations, in the public sector particularly, of course. And there were unions that connected with the Kitchell Corporation, private company, but uh, yes. But uh, again, it, the key word here is alignment. You've got to make sure that you get past their resistance in terms of the alignment factor and that you're satisfying some of their needs and their goals. And you should doggone well understand some of those and to spend a bit of time getting to that. I don't know if that answered the well, question. Well, it does answer the question. Because uh, um, well, one of the things that I have seen in the past and I, I, I'm going to be involved with is uh, there's a large union presence in many organizations. And there's significant resistance to training to begin with, let alone other things. So that's why I bring up the question. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, a lot of people, and keep in mind, I've been a member of ASTD in the past, so I feel like I can say this. And I hold a number of training certifications, and so I am a trainer. But a lot of oh, labor and a lot of people in leadership have not seen results from a flavor of the month kind of training. So I'm talking about making sure that whatever we do gets results. And believe me, at the US Department of, I'll never forget the first day, 
Here we are with this select group of leaders for the pilot and we're going over what's going to be happening in the program. And this one, forgive me, uh, good old boy sits back in the chair and he says, I've been in this dang organization for 50 years. And so he was one of the ones that was about to retire. And you honestly think you're going to change my behavior? He just said it right out there. And um, it was very interesting in the exit interview that we did uh, with this. He came aboard. He came aboard. He came aboard big time. And he really loved the whole concept. And he made a difference. That leader made a difference. So like Ann says, you would persevere. You, you don't give up. Yeah. So. Other questions? Well, any other uh, questions? Angie, did we ca cover your question on yeah. core comp? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Okay. So. Um, Angie, I don't want to come and give the floor all the time. So I no. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I love it. Why not? Give it the mic. Give it the mic. Yeah. I just kind of related to my accountability um, question before. Because you were talking about um, how you connect the work that you are doing, your competency model, and then getting maybe some of the buy-in to um, Patrick's question earlier about how do you get C-level buy-in and commitment. How do you isolate your result? Another one of my challenges right now. How do you isolate your results to the work that you're doing? So in other words, when you're talking about you know return on investment and bottom line, how do you isolate your what you are doing as contributing to that result? Well, it certainly helps if you have measurement, <laughs> you know, and that you can take that measurement, the before and after results, in. And it helps. Um, we, I really am a big believer in tying in as much um, PR to what you are doing as, as possible. And I'm kind of sneaky about that in a way. I mean, I, I work <laughs> I work at, uh, I've written speeches for the head uh, leader of a program on how to language what we are going to be doing. I wrote it. <laughs> Guess why? They're not going to say, you know, that this is going to make a difference and then come back to it later and announce that? No. So there are some simple measures too. So one of the ways we started measuring the value of what we bought was uses. So mm -hmm. on the internet, how many uses, how many printouts, how many people did we train, the HR business partners that we trained, how many meetings they had with leaders to transfer knowledge. So wherever we could find a way to display visibility of the product along with marketing and promoting it. Um, mm -hmm. So there are, there are creative ways to start to talk about people are using this and getting a benefit from it. Um, I've, I'm not shy about using anecdotal or uh, qua uh, qualitative information. Mm -hmm. So I will tell the stories from the HR business partners about I was in such and such a meeting with Bob and Bob had this issue with Joe and they talked together. and. We used the conflict model and went through it and created a contract and voila, they're now working together well. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I will use the qualitative stories as well. But that means I have to be listening for them and paying attention to it. Sometimes I find that easier than collecting the numbers actually, than pulling out the numbers. Yeah, me too. I, that's why I'm in this field. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think we might have time for one last question. Hmm. Seeing none, I would like to uh, wrap this portion of our meeting. We will have a few announcements uh, afterwards, but uh, I would like to thank Diane and Anne for sharing this competency model. And uh, you know, big takeaway for me is you got to go after alignment across all this, all those metrics. So please join me in thanking both of them for their presentation.